Okay, dealing with doubt. Um, don't shout. Uh, okay, some feedback from you to me. Thank you. Uh, apparently, sometimes I drop my voice. My family would say I mumble. It's true. It's a problem. You have all the permission in the world to put your hand up and call out, throw soft things, and tell me, say that again. Okay? That's fine. We're a family. It's all good. Um, uh, to, so the overall theme of the, of, the, of the studies is getting real about faith. And sometimes that can be a little challenging. Um, so I'm a little bit nervous about tonight uh, in the sense that some of the areas we're going to touch on might be a little bit raw for people. Uh, they're certainly a bit raw for me. So I might need a little bit of support, understanding and a small drinks break. Um, that's okay. Uh, I'm also a little concerned that uh, some things I say by necessity because I don't have 15 hours, um, they need to be somewhat high level, they need to be somewhat simplistic um, and I'm nervous that people will hear what I say through their pain and think it's a little too simple. Please understand, I know that. We're just going to be trying to give some broad brush tools and thoughts, um, and I know there's always more. So, I think that's enough of a disclaimer, um, but it is important. Right. Um, curiosity killed the cat. We all know that. And in about 2009 through to 2014, curiosity almost killed my faith. I had facts which I just could not ignore, and I had questions I couldn't answer. And I, I could try and pretend and hide those things from myself, from my wife, family, friends, but I'm not good at ignoring facts. That's not a strength of mine. There were two things that kept me in relationship. There were two things that underpinned my faith. One of them was the nation of Israel. It was just, I don't know, impossible to see any other way that God's people were in the promised land again. Way too much of a coincidence. That was an anchor for my faith. The other thing was I could see no other logical explanation for the empty tomb other than that Christ was raised. Jesus was alive. Israel was back in the land. Those two things anchored my life when, frankly, I felt like I was completely adrift. And as I referenced earlier, I had friends, friends, air quotes required, uh, who told me, um, just to declare yourself an atheist, uh, and get out, right? You're not feeding him. It wasn't true. It was a tough time, um, but those two things were my safety net. And it took a lot of reading, it took a lot of thinking, it took a lot of talking. Sarah came downstairs one day, uh, and this really was a, a great turning point for me, not her coming downstairs. Um, <laughs> and I was, it was about six o'clock on a Saturday morning. I had a different email account set up so I could try and talk to people about these things without it you know, being too visible to the family because I was afraid about the effect, right? And I found uh, there was uh, another Christadelphian who had the same opinion I did. And I was howling over the keyboard. And she came downstairs and I was like, I knew something was up. Of course she did. That was a turning point in the sense I knew I was no longer alone. Now, some of my opinions that I have now are probably wrong. And hopefully I'll disagree with myself in, you know, a few months or years' time. Some of my opinions probably would be highly offensive to you, some people here. And, look, I don't want to be too rude about it, but probably vice versa. We all have different opinions about some things. We share the fundamentals, right? God is real. Jesus is alive. And then beyond that, we have quite a bit of variation. But fellowship is about sharing Jesus' table, not protecting it. We want to grow the table of the Lord, not guard it. We believe in truth, but we believe in growth. We believe in real faith, and that means change. And that can mean discomfort. Okay. Let's, let's talk a little bit, because we're meant to be talking about Gideon, so I better do what I, was, what I kind of promised. Gideon strikes me as a pretty unlikely hero. Um, he repeatedly asked God for more evidence. 
I think, and you might find another example, but I think Gideon asked for more proof from God than any other character in the Bible. Right? He gets more proof. And it gets to the point where God actually says to him, Gideon, I know you're afraid. I've organised another bit of proof for you. Just sneak on down to the Midian camp. I've got this. Right? Our God's pretty amazing. He literally provides proof for a doubter without even being asked with Gideon. Sometimes we think we need faith that can move mountains all the time. That we need faith you can bend an iron bar around. We want to deal with that a little bit tonight. And Gideon, for me, is a great example of someone who didn't have that. He ended up faithful. That's God's final assessment. But he certainly had his doubts. And I think you look at Gideon's spiritual resume, there are some things on there that I've never done. Um, some of them probably good, like he smashed a Baal altar and an Asherah grove, and I think there's probably prison sentences if I tried that today. Uh, he took 300 men, he drove the Midianites out of the land of Israel. Uh, he rejected when uh, the nation said, we want to make you king. He said, no, God's the king, not me. He gave a fantastic example of a soft answer turns away wrath. One of the tribes came to him and said, why didn't you invite us to the war? Why do we have to miss out on the glory? Ephraim. And he just said to them, hey guys, you did really well. Like, you did better than me, really. Like, look at you. You did all right. Turns away. He could have stood on his digs and said, I'm the judge. You didn't come when I called, you know, and started a fight. Soft answer turns away wrath. Something I struggle with. Right? So some really good things that Gideon did. But then on the other hand, you've got a guy who, well, his name actually is Jeroboam. Baal will contend. It's a Baal-honouring name. He did have a Baal sanctuary in his house. Uh, he literally whips people with thorns that didn't support him enough, as he thought, and then he goes and burns a whole lot of people alive in a tower. Like, seriously problematic. But God's final assessment of Gideon, despite his flaws and his doubts, is that he was a faithful person. There are times when we look at Gideon as an example, we might think he is a complete and utter chumple. But, uh, you got that. Yeah. You spell it with a P. If you can't use the word chumple five times between now and Friday, did you even Armadale? Uh. He demonstrates that God can work with us through our doubts. And that's really important. Now, if you have a Bible, you might want to turn to Judges chapter 6 to make sure I'm not making too much of this up. Context, right? And you know some of this context. We've already talked about it a little bit with Deborah. Closing speech, farewell speech of Moses. Don't mix it up with the nation. Stay separate. Be loyal to me. Choose life. Closing speech of Joshua. I think it's Joshua 23. Same speech. Stay separate. Worship God. Stay away from the idols. Judges chapter 2. Introduction to the book, sure, prophet turns up and says, stay separate. Well, in Judges chapter 6, what happens? A prophet turns up again and says, and this will surprise you, stay separate. Stop worshipping their idols. That's important. Now we get to Gideon. Where is Gideon when we meet him? Well, verse 11, uh, we read that Gideon was in a wine press threshing wheat. Now, ancient Israel, obviously... If you're going to thresh your wheat, you'd want to do it somewhere convenient. That means you do it on the top of a mountain where you, know, you can thresh it, beat the wheat, throw it up in the air, and the wind blows away the chaff. Great. You don't do it in a wine press. What are you doing it in a wine press for? Because you're hiding. Remember Deborah? Of course you do. Where was Deborah? She was under a palm tree in the hill country, probably the only palm tree in the district. She was standing out like a sore thumb. There she was, in front of everybody. Where's Gideon when we meet him? Hiding away afraid in a wine press, things have gone downhill. God meets him in verse 12, or it's a messenger, he doesn't know it's an angel yet, right? But a messenger from God meets Gideon and says, What? The most unlikely words ever. The Lord is with you, courageous warrior. <laughs> you can imagine Gideon's response, like he's afraid of warriors at the moment, he's hiding from them, he's hiding from Midian. But that's what God says, you're a conquering mighty warrior. And look at Gideon's reaction uh, in verse 13. I'm going to read it because uh, it's, it's not good. Pardon me, but if the Lord is with us, why has such disaster overtaken us? 
Where are all his miraculous deeds that our ancestors told us about? They said, didn't the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord's abandoned us, handed us over to Midian. Now, it was one of the rules that we weren't allowed to refer to lightning uh, because... So we're not going to, (laughs) right? But it's kind of surprising that Gideon isn't like fried to a crisp right here. Okay? How could you, if you had any spiritual discernment, at all. Possibly say, where is God? Why has this happened to us? I mean, God apparently did stuff a long time ago, but why, why are we in this mess? What a dumb question. Moses told you. Joshua told you. Prophet at the start of uh, Judges told you. Prophet just told you just a few verses ago. Gideon wasn't paying a whole lot of attention to what God had to say. Perhaps you should say, perhaps we could say at least he was honest, but look, there's a couple of other problems. So in verse 15, Gideon protests and he says, look, I come from one of the smallest clans around, like my family's nothing and I'm nothing, you know, I'm the youngest. He had some serious insecurities going on. That's not good. There's a third problem, which is not actually explicitly mentioned. And it's the fact that Gideon and his family were in control of the local Baal and Asherah sanctuary. In fact, uh, a little bit later, you'll read that um, Gideon, when he tears down the Baal sanctuary, God very politely doesn't mention it up front, and Gideon certainly doesn't, but when he tears it down, he's got the use, it seems, of two bulls, which tells you the family had a little bit of money behind them, right? Um, Another thing interesting, uh, the, uh, the animal that represented the god Baal. Want to guess what the animal was? Does anyone know? Sure you do. A bull. A bull. Absolutely, which is exactly why Elijah, Elijah the prophet has a bull bring down fire from heaven. He's playing to you know, Baal's strengths in the contest, but that's not our subject. Um, a bull, right? So whether they're ceremonial or agricultural instruments, there was still a bit of wealth there with that family, uh, with Gideon's family. Perhaps conscience doth make cowards of us all, as uh, Shakespeare had Hamlet saying. But rather than fire and brimstone, look how God treats Gideon with his doubts. Okay? Verse 12, he calls him a mighty warrior. God's with you. Uh, verse 16, politely ignores the nonsense answer and says, you have strength, Gideon. Verse 16, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. No, 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 Gideon, God is with you. And then he patiently waits while Gideon goes off, gets the uh, sacrifice together and you know, um, gives him a sign by disappearing and uh, incinerating the offering. So one or two signs, depends how you count. I'm an accountant but not good with maths, so don't trust me on that. Um, now let's just translate what Gideon is saying into modern parlance, right? Let's put Gideon forward in our age. I know God has done some good stuff, right? Um, you know, I did Sunday school. And 1948, formation of Israel, 1967, that was really good. It was years before I was born. Uh, since then, look around. It's pretty. I don't see much. Uh, my ecclesias, um, how do I put this politely? We've downsized. I'm not one of the great families, right? I'm not from a famous family. I'm not no tall, I'm not a Russell. (laughs) And I could never be a Levick. (laughs) For years, atheist philosophy, thinking, has dominated the intellectual agenda. Faith everywhere is in decline, is in retreat. I don't know if my community has a future. And I've lost family over the time. That's what Gideon said in our words, in our language. Pretty tough. A lot of that hurts. And the angel said to him, 
God is with you, courageous warrior. Three times, God is with you. You have strength. What an amazing God we have. How patient is that? And he'll take a man who's worshipping Baal, hiding in a wine press, and make him a hero of faith. And God says to us in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it's one of my favourite passages and you can't stop me saying it, you are the children of God now. You don't think that he can translate us into his kingdom? If he can do that with Gideon, he can do that with you and me. I don't care what century you want to put those objections in. He can transform us to be what he has called us, his children. Gideon's in Hebrews 11, which is awesome. Because it says that heroes have doubts. Step away from Gideon for a moment. You might have seen something similar to this. There's a million and one of these around the place. This is loosely based on a piece that James Haywood put together. It's a rough model, okay? It's not a medical diagnosis. It's not too precise. It's just a way of thinking about stuff. And there's been a lot of people talk similarly uh, over the last few days. You know, our faith, hopefully, a lot of the time, if we're fortunate, is settled. It's stable. We have a faith model, a construct, an understanding of things which is kind of working for us. And that's an awesome place to be. That's a happy place to be. That's where a lot of our praise comes from. And most of the good psalms, happy psalms, come from. But the realities in life, from time to time all of us are going to hit challenge. It might be minor discomfort, it might be nuclear. And it can come in all different sorts. And that's going to cause us frequently to question our faith, to ask why. Why is God doing this to me? Why is this happening? How do I make sense of this with my faith construct? And sometimes we kind of can and we slip back to a settled faith and that's great. Other times we can't make sense of things. And we end up in that sort of deconstruction piece, which is not, you know, something we should fear as a negative. It's where we need to pull our faith apart. We need to break down our assumptions, the model we had, and, you know, look at the pieces on the floor. Think about how this fits together with our lived experience. It can be lonely. No one else is having this problem. Everybody else's faith is fine. They're all settled and happy, singing the hymns with gusto. And me, I've just got all these broken bits on the floor wondering if I can ever put this back together. With a bit of luck, a lot of love, maybe some help from our father, we can enter the rebuilding, the reconstruct phase. And that can be a fantastically exciting part of our faith journey, right? When I was trying to put things back together and sort of got out of the, you know, the guru um, and was, <laughs> was, was back to trying to put things together, it was an incredibly stimulating time for me. I read so many books. I was thinking. I was talking with people. I was heavily engaged spiritually. And it was so, like, it was awesome. And then you, you know, you get to a point where it's like, okay, I've kind of put this back together and there's not too many pieces that are left over and it's kind of it now works for me again it'll be different like anything I try and fix it's going to be different there's probably going to be a bit more uncertainty and when we've reconstructed rebuilt our faith there may well be as a result of that things we can't answer but maybe we've learnt to live with the question marks in a few spaces and hopefully probably it's a more robust Faith, a more, a more resilient faith, certainly to dealing with the kind of challenge that kicked us off in the first instance. But unfortunately, that's not the only option. Sometimes we, our loved ones, can get caught in a dead end where the deconstruction just turns into an ongoing negative of cynicism, Anger, depression, a whole host of negatives. And that can happen. 
and I've seen it happen uh, to friends of mine, and it's, it's pretty awful. Now, the value of these models is they just give us a way of thinking through some of the experiences of life that we have and, and maybe some of our friends. In a simple way, I get that. Maybe it helps us, though, reconfigure our thinking about them to be a little more growth mindset orientated, as Cecilia mentioned this morning. Where was Gideon? Well, he's certainly not settled. He's certainly aware of the challenge. I think he's deconstructed almost dead end. He doesn't have the answers, and I think he's given up. He's certainly having more than an each way bet with Baal. Not super healthy. For seven years, Gideon had seen the, um, the Midianites pillage Israel. That means he'd seen people die. He'd seen his brothers killed. He saw people starve. He saw people flee their homes, living in caves and dens, uh, Judges chapter 6 says. It was awful and there was no end in sight. And faced with these challenges, he's not very confident that God is going to do anything. I mean, why would God do anything? Gideon doesn't understand. He doesn't really rep- believe that God is with him, despite the fact he's told that three times. And the reality is, God is not always running around helping us straight away when we need it. And that's a painful reality. We referenced earlier today, um, we didn't coordinate, I promise, with Cecilia and I. Um, The reference was made to Jairus. Just think about Jairus. Because sometimes I think we see similar experience, right? Your baby girl is lying there at death's door. You appeal to Jesus for help. And Jesus appears to be maybe about to do something, right? He's on the way. And then he stops. Not only does he stop, he helps somebody else. Now, okay, she needs help. I get it. Her needs are important. I get it. She's been dealing with this issue for 12 years. Why can't she wait an hour? Because while Jesus is dealing with her, my daughter just died. And there's going to be times where we have got a crisis that needs to be dealt with now and it looks like Jesus is helping somebody else. He's busy helping someone else. And frankly, fine, but it could have waited. My situation genuinely was more important. My daughter died. I think Jesus is going to help us straight away every time. But as Jairus found out, Jesus helped someone else first, and his situation got way worse. Now, okay, that had a happy ending, right? Because Jesus went and he healed the daughter. But it wasn't particularly happy for a while there for Jairus when he saw what happened. And I think sometimes we might see God working in somebody else's life and think that's great, but my situation really needs help. And it's probably actually worse. Sometimes there is no answer. And we have to be really realistic about that. Psalm 44 is, I was going to say a favourite, but a favourite's the wrong word. Psalm 44 is a psalm of a faithful covenant community and they are appealing to God for help because they're in a war and they're fighting for their lives. They're like, we believe in you. We know what you've done in the past. Contrast Gideon, like we know what you've done in the past. We believe that and we believe that you are active and you will intervene to save us and we really, really need it. And the scribe finishes off Psalm 44 by saying, you know, like, we are like sheep being sent, uh, we are like sheep being sent to the slaughter. And it's almost like the ink just trails off the page and then there's just blood at the bottom of the scroll. There's no answer. There's no happy resolution. And that's the psalm that Paul decides to quote at the end of Romans chapter 8. You know, God is for us, who can be against us? But you know, there's times we're like sheep led to the slaughter. Sometimes Jesus appears to be working in someone else's life, priorities. Other times, there's radio silence. And that can really challenge our faith model. Gideon's hiding in the wine press. He's just getting by. He's a bet each way. He's not committed. 
probably all been in the wine press at some point, right? In 2005, um, there was a, a study that was published um, by the, um, the Social Science South Park Institute uh, that demonstrated that gingers have no soul. So, um, to try and compensate for that, I'm glad some of you got that reference. <laughs> None of you should have got the reference. To compensate for that, I just steal somebody else's poetry from time to time. Um, <clears throat> This uh, is a, a poem by a guy, uh, Yehuda Amachai. He was an Israeli poet. He's now deceased. I ran into it on an ABC podcast, All in the Mind. And I'm just going to let you read it while I get a drink. Doubts and loves dig up the world. I love that. That's good. Life doesn't go the direction that we expect in many ways, and very few people can brush off the difficulties that we face. I'm sure we know people who had very loud, uh, very intolerant opinions on subjects that have changed. I mean, you know, in my broader family, there was, you know, uh, and it's not uncommon, um, you know, divorce and remarriage, some people can really beat the drum and then suddenly life touches them, their broader family, and they have to rethink. And lo and behold, they end up with a softer, more loving opinion. Doubts, loves, dig up the world. Make space for new flowers to grow. Life can change in unexpected ways. That change is not a negative. That can create space for a beautiful thing. Now, of course, if you have a settled faith, that's fantastic, right? But if you've got a settled faith, and let's you know, pretend the hall's in quarters, and you know, everyone in the back corner, they're fantastic. They've got a settled faith, right? But everybody else, yeah, woo, go young people, right? Um, yeah, and the older people are like, yeah, I've done more laps around the sun, let me tell you. Um, we have to accommodate some wildly divergent opinions as people's faith is challenged by life. And you might have, you know, you've not gone through the challenges I have, so you don't necessarily understand. Okay, and this is problematic. Um, this requires a fair bit of, well, coal 314, the bond of perfection, love the superglue. Let's just say I had a hypothetical, completely hypothetical uh, a person in, in my congregation, we'll call him David for the sake of the argument, and let's say he put forward some paper to the ecclesia that said, um, I've been young, now I'm old, I've never seen the righteous without food and I've never seen their children begging bread. Now I might think, that's in the Psalms obviously, that's David, Psalm 37 verse 25, does anyone think that's true? That the godly are never abandoned, that their children never um, are begging for bread? I mean, what are all those ACBM collections? Right? Is it true? No! What are you, dewy-eyed, you know, rose-tinted glasses kind of going around with that, you know, dangerous stuff? We could be really dismissive of poor David. We could, we could put that out. You know, Paul, in Romans 14, he issues a really stern warning to the Gentile believers in the city of Rome because they were quite quite willing to walk around with their superior philosophical knowledge, their, you know, their deep understanding and education, you know, their worldly realism. They'd been around, they knew how things worked. And their Jewish believers, come on, mate, that's not how life works. And just crushed that. And Paul says in Romans 14, verse 1, receive the one who's weak in faith, according to you, Mr. Smarty Pants, and do not have disputes over differing opinions. Just stop it. Be a little more gentle. So you've got a David in your congregation. You've got someone who's settled faith and you know because of your life experience that that faith model might not really be ideal. Think about how you interact. And he goes on uh, and says in verse 22, Romans 14, the faith you have 
Keep to yourself before God. That doesn't mean don't share your faith. But that means don't go trumpeting your faith to put down somebody else who you might think, and you might have good reason, is a little naive. We have to be really careful. We may have found the answer to our problem. right? I may have found the answer to my problem, but it's my problem. It might not be yours. And my answer might not be the right answer for you, even if you have the same problem. Right? The, the answers that work for me leave my wife, wonderful woman, stone cold dead. Totally disinterested in my answers. They don't work for her. Cole 314. Slap it on liberally. We need a lot of love just to manage the differences in opinions because it can cut both ways. You know, young David with his, you know, never seen them begging bread. Well, he also needs to be careful that he doesn't judge me for being too cynical, too worldly wise, too addicted to, you know, quoting the Septuagint and Bible scholar X, Y and Z. We need a lot of love to keep it together as we go through the cycle at different paces for different reasons. If there's anyone in Scripture who went through some incredible retooling of his faith, it's Job. He went from basically the prosperity gospel to a position where he accepted God's explanation that, you know what, Job, things are just more complicated than you are ever going to comprehend. I'm bigger. The issues are bigger than your brain can deal with, Job. And that was the answer. That was the answer that Job got. And how did he cope? James 5, verse 11 says, You've heard of Job's patience, his endurance, and you've seen the Lord's purpose, that the Lord is full of compassion and mercy, brackets, eventually. Job is called patient and steadfast. He endured. How? And what does that mean to me? Job sat with the big questions. If there's one thing Job did, it was sit and wait. He didn't rush to the answers. He didn't set any arbitrary deadline that if I don't have this resolved by Thursday next week, I'm done. He didn't Google it for obvious reasons. He sat with the questions. He was prepared to accept he didn't have all the answers straight up. And that's hard. He didn't let his friends drive him away from faith, although they were a complete bunch of pains, and he did tell them that. He didn't withhold, like, telling God what he actually thought. I mean, Job says some you know, pretty blunt things to God. Right? So he was honest. He didn't give up on God. And he was encouraged to give up on God. Right up front, Job's wife says to him, curse God and die. Just walk away. Get it over and done with. Quit. Job refused. Patience. Hang in there with the uncertainty, the doubt, the no answers. That's what Job did, right? And I think that's you know, pretty powerful. We want fast answers. We want all that. Job says, no. Be kind to yourself. Don't be Job's friends. Be kind to your friend that's going through it. And if you're next to the person that's having to rebuild, reconstruct, that's figuring out what to do with all the pieces on the floor... Be patient with them. Understand it may take time. I would love to be able to get a magic syringe and just out of my arm and put it in the arm of my kids. Right? For everything. Don't go through the bumps and scrapes I had to. Be better than me and let me accelerate that learning somehow. You can't do it. And your friend, your family, your loved one, whoever it is, that's struggling with their faith falling apart, you wish you could just like take the answer and like just implant it in their head, but it's got to be their answer. And it's going to take time potentially. Don't know how long. And that flipping hurts. Because we see the pain and it hurts us. But we've got to wait. We have to be patient too. If it's not us going through it, we need to be patient with them. Was Job's theology as simple afterwards? No. 
When Job started off, he had a simple theology, like prosperity gospel, right? You know, do good things, get good things. Do bad things, get bad things. He had God basically confined in a bullet point list of theological statements, which he understood. And it was clear and simple and God was there between bullet point one and 30. What did his theology look like afterwards? Because God said to him, Job, it's bigger and more complicated than you can understand. And Job said at the end of his trial, I thought I knew God. I thought I had him. I thought I had him in my bullet points. But at the end, he says, but now I've seen you face to face. I've moved from bullet points. I've captured God in my theological model to now I've seen you. I have relationship. I accept there are things I no longer know. I accept I have unresolved question marks that I'm not going to be able to fill in. I don't know what you're like. I'm really bad with not knowing. I could have cried when I realised that I was never going to be able to learn Hebrew and Greek and all the things and that I was just too old, too dumb, too late. Right? I want to know. Job had to, we all have to, learn. There's going to be things which are just going to be question marks. And our faith has to incorporate that uncertainty, that unknown. It can be hard. We might be less certain, but we probably have a more resilient model of faith as a result. And hopefully, a loving faith carries its opinions lightly and gently. Because we know what cost those opinions came at. A friend of mine said, Nat Rittmeyer, um, if you accept the resurrection, everything else is just detail. Now that might feel cold, okay? So I'm going to disclaim it and twist that a bit because it kind of depends on what the challenge is you're facing. For me and the context of that statement, it was about answering theological questions. You know, how do you understand Genesis, Joshua, Judges, you know, chronologies and stuff? Right? It was not personal, it wasn't an illness or death or many of those personal things. Right? But if we can just keep it in that theological box for a second. If you accept the resurrection, everything else is just detail. Just sit and wait, is what he was telling me. The resurrection is an anchor for your faith, Daniel. Yes, it is. Okay, cool. Then sit tight. That's what matters. Everything else you can sort out in time, maybe, or not. Hang on the resurrection. And I told you the state of Israel was the other anchor for me. I don't know what your anchor is or anchors, but I really suggest you find them. Know what it is that underpins your faith and hang on that. Now, I'm a little bit nervous on this. So I'm going to do lots of disclaimers tonight. Um, a friend of mine, another friend, Uh, He said, as Christadelphians, frequently, we genuinely believe in the doctrine of salvation by syllabus. That's good, isn't it? Like, the more ticks you get, like, (laughs) okay. I am not preaching salvation by syllabus, okay? (laughs) But (laughs) I want to go to Psalm 73, right? You can turn there if you want, or you can just trust me, which is dangerous. Psalm 73... Um, You've got a guy who was in all sorts of trouble about his faith. And he says in verse 3, 2, as for me, my feet had slipped. You know, I basically, I was like whooshka. I was falling off the path three quarters of the way out the door. I couldn't hang my faith together anymore. It was broken. Why? Well, he says in verse 13 and 14, he saw the prosperity of the wicked He said, I concluded, surely in vain I've kept my motives pure and maintained a pure lifestyle. I suffer all day long and I'm punished every morning. It's just not working. Right? Where's God? What's he doing for me? You know, the wicked are doing great and here am I, suffering. This doesn't work. And he says in the psalm, you know, I didn't dare talk to my friends. I didn't want to drag them down. That's a pretty normal thing, I reckon. 
I didn't want to drag him down. I kept my fear and my doubts to myself. But he resolves it. There's a happy ending. And what's the basis of the happy ending? What's the trigger for him that that spins it around? Well, it's verse 17. Then I entered the precincts of God's temple and then I understood the whole picture and how it worked. I think he kept going to temple. Even though he was... He was feeling like a hypocrite. He was feeling like a fish out of water, like he'd contaminate his friends. But he kept going. If I want to catch a fish, because I want to fish for some reason, I don't bait up a hook uh, and toss it onto the hockey field here at Neggs, because it's out of bounds. (laughs) That wasn't fair. Um, (laughs) True, though. If I want to find relationship with God, isn't it easier to go where there are people who have relationship with God? You know, ritual's dangerous. I get that, right? We all know that. But at the same time, Jesus implemented a couple of rituals because our Father knows us. And he knows sometimes we need to act faith to get faith. Sometimes we just need to be in the right place and maybe the spark, the lightning, maybe the spark uh, will hit us and we come back. You know, jump starts the heart and gets us going again. I'm not saying it's the answer, right? But it certainly was the answer for uh, the psalmist in Psalm 73. Here's another uh, possible tool to help as we try and retool our faith, as we wrestle with patience. And it's this stop thinking that faith has to be this shiny, perfect bauble, right? Your faith has to move mountains. And if you can't move the Andes from one continent to another, go home, right? Yeah, it's true, but it's so dangerous, right? It creates this environment where we're all perfect. How's your faith? Ken, perfect, excellent, so's mine. We wouldn't say anything different. I mean, we wouldn't ask the question just in case Ken says something else, right? But we're all perfect faith. Ben Steele around my faith all the time. It's just not true. Now, I have a a spiritual mentor um, and a great friend who gave me this idea of of reframing what faith needs to be. Janine Henney. I I know she's a friend of, of many here. I thought this idea, when Janine said this to me, I was scandalised. I was. I thought it was just like shocking. So if you think it's shocking, um, just wait a few years. Maybe, maybe not. Um, I'm a fast runner, so I'm not worried. (laughs) I got bullied at school, so I was very fast. Um, The idea kind of came from uh, Mike McHaghew's axioms of faith, right? We define acceptable faith as this incredibly high bar and there's only one standard. Okay, yeah, cool. Park that in the corner. How about we think about faith as a destination? How about we be kind to ourselves, kind to our loved ones, kind to our friends who are struggling to sort of hit this mythical high bar? What if we redefine faith in more of a continuum kind of piece as a way of building a path, of building a bridge back to faith? Let's try a few. Jesus is the Son of God. I can't come at that now. Not ready for it. Okay. Jesus is an amazing teacher. Yeah, okay. I believe in God. Not sure how much. I believe in good. I come to worship God. I come wondering whether I can find God. I love being here with Jesus. I love being with Jesus' people. I'm unsure about the power of the Spirit, but I do believe in the power of love. I don't know about the kingdom. Is that coming now? But I do believe something has to change with the world as it is.
I'm unsure about the power of the Spirit, but I believe the power of love. Rather than I can't stay here because I have serious doubts, I need to exit stage left, rather than the toxic, corrosive, I'm a hypocrite label that we will slap on ourselves and do a lot of damage, maybe we can redefine faith a little different. High bars and low bars. The destination. We want to get there. And sometimes we're not. Shooting ourselves in the head, declaring ourselves a failure, that isn't going to help us progress. So be patient. Find your faith rocks. Keep good spiritual company. And maybe define faith in a way that you can build up rather than feel like you're always torn down. God is love. That means he's on the journey with us, despite our faults and challenges. Let's go back to Gideon for 10 seconds. Gideon had a lot of challenges. Think about how God worked with Gideon. I cannot think of anybody in the Bible who received more signs than Gideon. First of all, he's got the sacrifice, you know, it goes up in smoke and the angel disappears. Then he goes, you know, wet fleece, dry ground, dry ground, wet fleece. And then eventually God says, look, if you're scared, because I know you are, head on down, I've arranged a sign for you in advance. Don't even ask me this time. I've just done it for you. More signs than anybody. And God just keeps on giving, four or five, depending on how you count. Gideon keeps getting help from God. God keeps working with him. He goes from the wine press to a hero of faith. What's the difference? What drives that journey? God does. Now, I don't like fridge magnet Christianity or bumper sticker Christianity. Um, so often the context just gets completely ignored. So I have checked these for you and these ones are right. Luke 12, verse 32. Fear not, little flock. It is God, it's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 9. God called us to save us, not destroy us. Those things are just straight up fact. It means that God is on our side as much as he was with Gideon. That he's prepared to give us the help and the assistance as he was with Gideon. How? Well, it'll take time. And we don't know when the time's going to happen. One of my favourite quotes in the Bible, Mark chapter 9, verse 24. You know, the father of a sick boy, painfully aware that you know, his faith is inadequate. Jesus says, if you have faith, I can heal the boy. I mean, that's crushing when you've got doubts like the father did. And he said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I mean, just transactionally walk through this for a second. If you believe, yes, I can heal your son. And the father politely says, I believe, but I don't believe enough. Please help me. And Jesus cuts the conversation. Not another word is spoken. Jesus just marches straight forward and heals the kid. That's our Lord. Help my unbelief. And Jesus did. I love that. And I hang on to that. Because there are times, no matter how much I might be standing here versus sitting there, my faith is measured in thimbles. We all are at times. Yeah, I liked it. <laughs> How should we respond when someone says their faith is challenged? Not like Job's friends. Like that's exhibit A, not like that. Right? How? Like God did with Gideon, with a lot of patience. Like Jesus did. Right? We know the story. Almost all of us know the story. Someone reminded me uh, over lunch today that actually not everyone does. So, a little bit more detail. That's cool. Jesus has been raised. And Thomas, one of the uh, disciples, he says, I don't believe. I do not believe in the resurrection. Right? The women are telling him it happened. 
Peter's telling him it's happened. James is telling him. The other is telling him. And he's like, no, I don't believe. I will not believe unless I touch the wounds. And Jesus waits like, well, I mean, first, Jesus does not, sorry, Mark, fry him to a crisp. The apostles, right, they don't exit him from the building because he didn't sign up to clause one of the Jerusalem amended statement of faith. Jesus is risen. Very straightforward. And it's eight days before Jesus appears. Now you think, eight days, okay, hmm, cool, eight days. Jesus was only on the earth after his resurrection for 40 days. 20% of that time, he's got one of his apostles not buying it. And then when Jesus turns up, he doesn't castigate Thomas. Here you are. Is this the evidence you need? Here it is. He doesn't do it on day one. He doesn't do it on day two. Surely he's going to do it by day three. No, no. In his time. Here it is, Thomas. He gives him that evidence. We don't know when it's going to happen for our loved ones. We don't know how it's going to happen for our loved ones. Thomas gives me some confidence that that's how Jesus operates when he knows. Side point, how do we talk about Thomas? He's called Doubting Thomas, isn't he? You know how many times he appears in the Gospels? I reckon it's three incidents, right? One of them is this incident here where he goes, not going to believe unless I see the evidence. Right? That's one of them. One of them is kind of neutral. It's a bit of a man, it's just mentioned you know, by the way. Uh, the other one was when they're sort of down, um, about to go up to see Lazarus, uh, Mary and Martha, and Lazarus dies, and Jesus goes, right, we're going up to Jerusalem. And Thomas, and everyone's like, well, that's really dumb. You're going to get killed. You will die. And Thomas says, let's go with him, and we'll die with him. And we call him Doubting Thomas. We could call him Thomas the Brave. How do you think about your friend that's going through a faith crisis or is maybe sitting in a dead end? Do we remember that they used to have settled faith? Do we remember that they used to have the shiny bauble? Or do we just think about them as doubting Thomas? Right? Are we confident they're going to bounce back? Do we remember their past? Or do we treat them like they're contagious? Because we're afraid of doubt. We're all afraid of doubt. It's hard to talk about. It's hard to talk to people who have, you know, in the process of breaking their faith or in a dead end and throwing the baby out with the bathwater and and are negative and cynical and angry and confused. It's hard. How we think about them and talk about them really matters. Which are we going to choose? Thomas the Brave? Doubting Thomas. It actually matters. We shouldn't give up on faith when it's challenged. Our faith. And we shouldn't give up on the faith of our friends. Except there is a cycle. It's possible to rebuild. I'm going to give you a magic word. It's not abracadabra. It's much easier to spell. It's the word yet. I don't have enough faith yet. My partner hasn't come back yet. My kids, yet. Man, I hang on to that word because it hurts. I'm sure we know of many late bloomers. People who walked out from Sunday school at, you know, 13, 14, 15, then they come back at 40, 50, 60, 70. We had, a, 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 we had a prodigal walk back into our meeting and was baptised. Anyone from Halifax remember how old she was? I'm sure she was in her 70s. Yeah? Yeah? Stop crying, Sarah. You're not helping. Thank you for that. That helped me. Sorry, Sarah. It's a very powerful word, yet.
James 5 verse 16 says we should confess our faults to each other. (laughs) Does anyone want to pretend they get better than three out of ten on that? (laughs) We do a terrible job. Do we know where people are at? Do you know where the person next to you is at? Your partner, kids, parents, friends. Are they challenged? We probably know that. Are they deconstructing, deconstructing, reconstructing? Are they in a dead end? Where are they? Where are you? Who knows? Who knows where you are? Everyone around us is going through cycles. Everyone in this hall is somewhere on the simplistic wheel. And the stories of the past, like Gideon, they give us permission to see that wrestling with our doubts is okay. That God is giving us permission to do that and will work with us as we do that. That he's prepared for us to ask him the hard questions to challenge him. Now, ideally, we can talk to others about their position. We don't necessarily have the answers. I find it impossible. I really... When people come to you and they think you know something and you're like, oh, I can answer my problem, but I'm not sure how to answer yours. All I can do is be patient with you. Knowing we don't know is probably helpful. James 5.16 says, more than confess your faults. It also says, and I want to read it, pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great effectiveness. James 5.16 Can we pray for our faith to be stronger? Yes. Can we pray for our loved ones to find a way back to discipleship? Yes. When's that prayer going to be answered? Maybe not yet. I don't know when. But does God hear it? Yes. Does God respond to those things? Yes. I don't know how. don't know when. But he will. Prayer is powerful. It makes a difference. And there's going to come a day, maybe it's the judgment seat, when the the power of prayer is going to be revealed to us and it's going to shock us how God's grace acts is going to surprise us. God can take us from hiding in a wine press to being a hero of faith. Not can, does, will. God can take us from doubt, from sorrow to joy. Our hope is... The time when you know, God wipes away all tears from our eyes. Tears about our faith and discipleship and tears about our beloved ones. What does it mean God's going to wipe away all of our tears? I don't know. But I know that God is a father. I know that prayer is effective and powerful. And I know that God is love.